first one around in Clayton was the partial with respect to the court and Right. So make sure that you've, you've got that right. Okay, and so then we get our Lagrange sure equation that using like that. that. <coughs> yeah, I, I see right that one. there, right? Okay, so that's how we're going to get our Lagrange from that one. And that has to be constant. Okay. Yeah. In a situation that has phi symmetry, right? Right. No lumps in the right. phi coordinate means no bumps, right? <laughs> You get a smooth ride, okay. so no change in momentum. So we are, yeah, we're going to need to be doing an integral I'm there. The Pardon? We're going to need to do an integral there. Or are we going to always do there? Or we gonna always it's, all, it? it's all contained. Now your now your only thing that's left is, is radius. So you have an effective potential. Yeah, I'm, I'm done after this one. So that involves the gravity? I'm yeah, I'm, I know. I'm just trying to figure out how to solve this one. So we have the momentum, which is constant, in mm -hmm. the phi direction. Mm -hmm. And so then we take... In order to kind of get something out of this, we need to take the derivative of those Rangian with respect to, I guess, phi dot. No, not phi dot. Depending on what course is actually offered. It's just this one is actually phi dot. But then you might get something that is needed in the research. Yeah, okay, there we go. That's what I said, depending on what course is offered. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. You need to set those polar. And that's got to be constant. So then it's a question of what does the. Resulting uh, effective potential look like, and what's its curvature at the bottom? You got to find the bottom, and then you got to find what the curvature is at the bottom. Go look over the uh, the eyeball uh, okay. solution because it's going to be similar. We're going to follow the same on. method, but in yeah, there's gravity points. in that, right? Yeah, it's the same method, but we're doing it with a different geometry of the. We got a curve, geometry, right? And this yeah. one's a, a funnel instead. Yeah. A funnel, yeah. So just the method is what I'm looking for. Yeah. It's just like the eyeball. That makes sense. That's the section that we use. You can even borrow the eyeball. <laughs> 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 that way I'll really lose it. Here it is. Right here. <laughs> okay, go ahead and spin around. And roll. roll it. It's a part, part of that question there. Okay, the um, topic today is uh, charge field mechanics. This is where we have a Lagrangian that is dependent on uh, something uh, that, uh, if you recall, the potential uh, of a uh, Lagrangian should uh, only be a function of coordinate, not of uh, momentum. Well, we're going to break that rule today. Uh, with an uh, uh, introduction of the electromagnetic fields. And one of the strangest things about an electromagnetic field is our first uh, slide over there uh, uh, shows it is the, the weird situation in which uh, you apply a force on something, say I'm going to move this thing over to here, and you go like this, and it responds by going this way, or this way or that way. In other words, perpendicular to what you're applying. That's weird. I mean, we're not used to that. We don't, you, we, unless you're uh, uh, very familiar with rotational motion, you're not used to it. Okay, the forces you feel at a carnival, <laughs> Coriolis forces, they act like that. So this is, that's a mechanical analog. And we have even better mechanical analog set up today. I hope it works. We also have videos of it of uh, doing its thing, and that is uh, doing a mechanical analog of a cyclotron. It has not only an electric field in there by tilting the table, that's the analog of an electric field, but the magnetic field is analogous to rotation of the table. So we're going to be looking at that thing uh, in real life, assuming it works. It's uh, quite a Gold, Rube Goldberg machine that we've got over there that I I put together a Georgia Tech and then brought it here. <laughs> it's haunted me ever since. Um, the uh, thing that we have to do first, though, is get the, the uh, while, you're, while you're still awake, go through 
uh, Lagrange's equation one more time, this time using the tensor analysis that we've been playing with uh, and uh, um, develop uh, the effect of a streaming potential, that's the vector potential in E and M, and this, as well as the scalar potential uh, of electromagnetism. The effect of those two variables, so four variables, this is getting into relativity now uh, already, it's hiding in the, in the background there, uh, of a four potential, uh, essentially. So I want to look at uh, just the vector analysis of it and get used to sophomore physics that you probably already know, but I'm going to introduce something called the FBI rule. FBI has appeared in the news a lot today as they're investigating the president. And so I'm going to show you the FBI rule. It's a real neat way that I've figured out to uh, remember what direction it really goes when you push on it in a magnetic field. After that, I went to Lagrangian, and then we're going to calculate the Hamiltonian using the Poincaré or Lagrange transformation, and see what the canonical momentum is. And it isn't just P. Uh, it involves the electromagnetic uh, vector potential as well. And then, um, once we got that out of the way in Hamilton's equations, uh, check, we're going to just check Hamilton's equations against the fundamental ones that are written on this very first slide. Well, once we get all that out of the way, then I want to uh, go ahead and just take a look at the classical Hall effect, um, the, the uh, cyclotron orbit uh, equations. Now, um, they're kind of complicated the way they're you know, often presented in um, mechanics books I've seen. I, what I'm going to show you is if you just make a complex variable out of uh, all of your classical variables, uh, it's really easy to uh, see what that equation is doing and write it all down and then visualize it. And uh, we'll uh, visualize it uh, a little bit first before we show uh, this machine. And um, then uh, I've got a, a couple of things at the end of this lecture. Uh, once again, I've got some cycloid geometry and, and uh, core, uh, uh, stuff for this uh, problem uh, that you're uh, getting uh, this week. And you might as well uh, take time, if we have time, we'll look at these, the, ge the cycloidal geometry of a flying lever. That's something, that very fundamental cycloid uh, geometry. And then it, it also uh, is the thing that uh, determines how, make, how high they make the uh, bumpers in a pool hall, uh, a pool table. Okay, with that uh, out of the way, let's go here. We'll try to track the two screens uh, closely here. But basically, these are Maxwell's equations uh, in their potential form. Electric field, we all know minus the gradient, that's the physicist uh, 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 derivative relationship for uh, uh, a, a force of a unit charge, uh, assuming the potential has been, uh, the, the voltage of the function is uh, correct, but also if there's a streaming uh, vector potential around, it's the time derivative of that that determines with a minus sign, the electric field. And then the B field, it's, it's uh, one that's uh, thought to be associated with the vector potential. It's just the curl. Now, we mentioned uh, already uh, that that was one of the applications of complex variables. It was kind of neat. If you just stuck to two dimensions, it worked pretty well. In any case, uh, this rule right here for remembering how they uh, appear in, well, here's Newton 2, and that's all you'd have if you're just worried about an electric field. Uh, that would be the force, the electronic charge, or the, whatever charge uh, times it, uh, would be the force. So this is just F equal MA for electromagnetism. But this guy right here, the V cross B, uh, that's the uh, the real fly in the ointment. That's one that says if you go along uh, and push in the direction of, of V, you're going to feel a force uh, that's perpendicular uh, to it. And that force's uh, direction is most easily um, done by the right-hand rule. Now, it always was agreed that politically the FBI was on the right. Okay, and that's certainly true in the 60s. Now it's uh, kind of to take a different side. 
okay? And, but nevertheless, you use your right hand and you just on the, uh, for the three fingers to the, to the uh, right, write F, B, and I, okay? Now, how do you remember to do to FBI? FBI, they have guns, right? Bang, right? There's the gun, okay? So there's the F, B, and I. And that will tell you where. You can just point your, your, your middle finger uh, in the direction of wherever the magnetic field is, say, up or horizontally like that one. And then the uh, actual force that will be resulting from a current I a current I, uh, which would be QV, charge times velocity vector, okay, uh, is given uh, just by this little triad. So whether you use that for teaching or not depends on your, your political inclinations, right? Okay, it's a nice mnemonic. All right, so it's this thing that we're dealing with right here. This has got to be turned into Lagrange's equations in order to make it into classical mechanics in its normal form. All right, so we got a little bit of work to, to do that. That's not an easy task at all. Uh, one of the things that you have to do first is, do, is figure out a nice way to handle the double cross. Okay, and that's where the epsilon tensor comes in. So this is, this is uh, epsilon, uh, that's levi civita uh, tensor. Uh, 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 it has an Italian uh, uh, ancestry. So this is the first time we've got some Italian physics going here, uh, for sure. Uh, but in any case, uh, this tensor is totally anisometric. And it's the basis of a whole other way to do the kind of stuff we're doing here uh, using what's called exterior calculus and antisymmetric uh, um, uh, uh, forms, uh, which I tried to give a course in it once and it was a complete flop because it's kind of abstract and uh, maybe we come back now that it's, now that gravity has got, become a real fee field, uh, we, 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 we bring this up again. But in any case, the idea is that this uh, tensor right here is what we use to make a cross product. So the basic idea of it is that it is completely anti-symmetric. That means that if any two indices uh, 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 in there, if any, of, any index there equals another one, uh, you have nothing. Uh, so very, there are very, a very small number of components of this thing, basically permutations of the number of dimensions that you're working with. In this case, we're working with three dimensions. So there's going to be six values that it can have, uh, or six positions of the indices, and then uh, it can either be plus one or minus one, or most likely a zero. So that's the basic idea. If I have i, j, and k in alphabetical order here, and I just uh, cycle them along, I will maintain that value of uh, plus one. But if I just flip a pair, like ij here to ji, I pick up a minus sign. Same thing if I flick j and k uh, with each other, like I did here. Or if I uh, flip uh, um, this thing, uh, i and j, I'm sorry, if I, uh, am I doing this right here? I want to make sure I've got the right thing uh, here. I've left um, k, uh, hmm, that's, that's strange, j. <laughs> I mean, you just started a cycle on the bottom. The, this is a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. It should be positive. Okay, the, the, this, yeah, god damn, I should have looked at this a little more carefully. Um, but anyway, there, there are six cases where it is just a cycle, um, and th that should be those three. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit here. here, I bring the, the J here. It looks like I just flipped uh, K and J on this one, so this one should be down here and this one should be up here. This one would be minus. Any question? <laughs> Jeez, how could I miss that? That's terrible. <laughs> okay, but in any case, th this one is a cycle. All, all of them have changed uh, position. Uh, that means there were two flips involved, and that makes a minus times a minus, which is plus. So, uh, 
six permutations that are odd, six permutations, three, uh, three permutations that are odd uh, out of six factorial, uh, th three, three factorial, which is six, and then three, uh, if I switch these two guys right here, uh, that are even. So uh, the idea is that when you're uh, making a cross product and you're looking for the j component, then uh, you, you would do an epsilon a, b for those two components of j, and that would give you the j component of the curl of a, that is del cross a, partial cross a, uh, a, b. So we'd be summing over these. There'd only be two uh, terms to that sum. Okay. Uh, uh, x, say j with z, then there would be an x, y, and a y, x with a minus sign. And that's uh, kind of a nice way to write a uh, curl that is generalizable to uh, higher dimensions, I might add. And then uh, th this whole thing right here, i and j, that, that's uh, taking this uh, curl a, which is b, uh, the jth component of b, okay, and crossing it with the, uh, the v, that is i and j now appear uh, being summed over here to give me the kth component of this whole thing here, okay? And then this thing inside here is given by another epsilon tensor that represents uh, the calculation of the uh, del cross A. So the first one is V cross this thing, and this thing has a J component, I component, sits there right there, on, uh, opposite the thing that says the whole thing. Now, this, <laughs> this sounds con confusing, and also, uh, it's more than just typographically confusing, but it's actually the simplest way to handle this kind of, of, uh, of stuff. And it, as I say, it is the way uh, that they do exterior calculus. And they use just really one identity, if we're, if we're only confining ourselves uh, to a, a couple of products here. Um, this one is the thing that turns this into an expression that just involves delta functions, which are kind of the opposite to the symmetric uh, levi Shavita tensors, um, the ones that we've been working with, the Kronecker deltas. But uh, the basic idea is, and this is an easy thing to prove this thing, because in three dimensions there's only so many things that you can write out, and that's probably the best way uh, to do the proof of this uh, funny relation here. But the form of it is interesting. Uh, say you take one index from this and one index from this. Let's take the last indices. Okay, so I got a k i j here. I got an a b j there. What I'm going to be getting is a term that involves k and a together. That's k and a, the first one together, uh, and then i and b uh, together, uh, right here. And you subtract the one in which the A and B switch places. So this one had K and A together, I and B together. I switch uh, to get the B over on K and the A over on I instead of uh, <coughs> a B. Okay, so that's all you need uh, to do this whole maneuver that we're going to do to develop the Lagrange equations uh, for the uh, electromagnetism. That's uh, off to a rocky start, but it gets better. Uh, believe me, as Trump says. Okay. So, uh, what I do uh, right right away here is use the Levy uh, identity, and then I work out what these two terms are. And this one's demanding that uh, A be equal to K. So I'm going to be writing uh, anything um, that has an A in it to be k. k sits outside, I can't change that. Okay. Um, the <clears throat> the uh, next step is to uh, everywhere I see uh, an i, I replace that i with b, or everywhere I see a b, I replace it with i, either one. Okay. And uh, same thing with that second term. So here uh, it, we go, I replace the i with a b. Okay for that delta right there. And uh, I have an A and a B in here. The A has to be changed to the, the K, that's the outside index for this complicated uh, expression. Same thing here, except now the, uh, the B has uh, got the K and it's hanging off of the A here. 
the partial a v a. That's a sum. I keep that, uh, and anywhere I uh, have a i, I make it a. So that's why that one is it. So we got these these two guys, and then we convert it back to, to um, uh, Gibbs notation, but we 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 be careful about that. Um, this little thing here can be written as a partial with respect to k of this product minus the, the, the factor that was left out of this uh, thing to make this term right here. And this one I just leave alone. So once you have that, then you can write it in Gibbs notation, which most people now are more familiar with than this, but it's a good idea to get familiar with this because it's very powerful. So this one right here I would have written as grad a dot v. And then I would be subtracting here a v dot, and it would be the grad a, the whole thing is a tensor, okay? Then I rewrite uh, this one uh, as that. Okay, so that in, in is, is, is kind of weird, but Gibbs bold notation, you see, doesn't really necessarily handle tensors that well, but it is a nice shorthand in some ways. Now, here's the rub. This is the thing that makes it possible for us to have Lagrange's equations here. Newtonian mechanics has no explicit dependence of position r and the velocity v, okay, uh, as well, basically what we're, what we're saying is that those, those really are independent variables. And the r partial derivative of v, or vice versa, identically zero. Okay, so this one's got to go. That has got to be identically zero for, for mechanics. We, from the very beginning of Newtonian mechanics, think of a particle as being placed at a certain initial position and given an initial velocity. And those are two independent things. That's why we're doing that. So far, so good. This is, as I say, this is the rocky start page here. But it's, it's what we need to go uh, into the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian of electromagnetism. Very fundamental stuff. OK, let's go ahead on this screen till uh, we get uh, everything uh, that we just said. All right. Okay, so we're going to bring this up and take this this thing uh, into Lagrange's uh, form. That is uh, our uh, job right now. V cross B equals the gradient of the dot product of A and V, and then. V dot, this weird tensor here, the gradient of A, gradient of a vector, that's a whole matrix, which when dotted would make a vector that's the same character as this gradient, and uh, the same rank, I should say, as, as this, and this, of course, is a vector, three-dimensional vector. Okay, so we're writing, um, you know, this stuff, and I want to make a point that the tensor index notation helps you to unravel uh, the Gibbs notation, make it more uh, usable. I can do, you know, a grad A, that's a tensor dot, a vector, I can do the vector dot grad A, I can do grad A dot V, you see, uh, all of these things uh, can be written in a notation. It's much more uh, non ambiguous. In other words, it's much more explicit. So that, that's, I think, an important uh, uh, part of any of the courses we take now that uses uh, vector analysis. And uh, that's what we're uh, at work here. So uh, what we're going to do uh, is take this form here. This is V cross B. There's the uh, thing that you have to tack on to the E that you would normally just write as a gradient of a scalar, but now we've got um, some currents and stuff around. Uh, something's flowing, so we need the streaming, something streaming, so to speak. We need the streaming potential, uh, A, and it plays a big role uh, in uh, this. It makes the uh, Newton's equations much more complicated uh, than they were before. 
So, uh, what we immediately do to get this started, and it kind of finishes it, uh, and that is to take the uh, time derivative, the absolute time derivative of the, uh, of the vector of potential field as a chain rule expansion in all four uh, variables in time. This is, we're, we're going to allow uh, A to be an explicit function of time. Uh, and if we do that, we need this fourth term here, as well as the uh, uh, spatial dependencies uh, of the uh, vector potential. So what we end up with here is V dot grad A, and then that explicit time dependence, if there is any, of A uh, is this one term of the uh, four term uh, total time derivative. So uh, what we're doing, you see, is we're going to replace this thing here, okay, uh, with something that involves this and this. And then there'll be this thing there as well. Uh, already uh, in place. Okay, so this is what you get. You get that the uh, mass times acceleration is equal to, well, there's the grad phi, but now we have a slightly different way to write uh, what's left. We still have this guy here, but this thing minus that thing, okay, this thing minus that thing is there. So we have a little bit of uh, uh, manipulations uh, to do. Uh, to fix that. So what we do is take advantage of this chain rule uh, relation to write it in a much more compact form. So we're going to have the scalar potential that we take a gradient of, and then we're going to have something to do with the magnetism that also is going to have the gradient taken. That's this guy right here. And then um, we have the total time derivative of A uh, in the expression instead of the partial. Well, we start sliding some terms around here. Um, this uh, is the, uh, what we're isolating here, kinetic energy. Um, and that, uh, that guy right there, I, I'm realizing uh, now that I have a, a, a Lagrangian-like expression coming up here, uh, that I'm going to replace that uh, with the uh, Lagrange. So there's the start of making this thing into a Lagrange's equation. And then uh, we have these two guys hanging on here. The total time derivative of Ea. And we're going to uh, put that uh, in an expression that involves the partial derivative with respect to V of the uh, this guy that had an EV dependence, but it doesn't. This one does. So th this uh, this step here re requires something. It requires that our scalar potential is not a function of V. Remember we said that anything that we treated as a potential uh, should not uh, have uh, a velocity dependence. Okay? We're going to break that rule now, uh, finally. Uh, we've got here something, that, a part of it, that has a uh, velocity dependence, the streaming potential. But we're still going to demand that our scalar potential doesn't have that. You know, we had to have that in order to get the Lagrange, the Lagrange equations uh, uh, together. So here we have it. This is the form of Lagrange's equation for this crazy thing here with this uh, scalar potential minus the velocity dot the vector potential uh, is in the place that we would normally just have a potential phi. Okay? And there's the partial derivative with respect to the gradient of, of that with respect to space. And then this is a velocity gradient right here. That's the first, the kinetic part of the Lagrange's equations. And uh, we're almost done. That's the way to write it if you're going to write it the way uh, we have been writing it. Okay? So you see, this is, this is really weird stuff. I mean, the stuff that's going on here behind the scenes. It's just, it, it is still mind-boggling. It's still uh, really quite wonderful. It seems to, any way you can find a, a way to begin to understand these, we treasure. Okay, now, um, this linear velocity term, this is, this is the thing that's sort of weird. 
in addition to the usual quadratic. Uh, that, that's a key thing here. The Lagrangian being a function of velocity, okay, and then position, uh, depending on these fields, uh, is the uh, key uh, uh, thing that we have here. So I'm going to catch up uh, with this um, uh, screen uh, here. So we end up with Lagrange, Lagrangian uh, at the bottom. It is interfering a little bit with our uh, 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 screen optics, but um, that's, that's the, the thing that we want to work with here. Now, we still have one more step to go, and that is to make a Hamiltonian out of this. This is a very nice Lagrangian, but what do we do? And that, of course, means we've got to figure out what the canonical momentum is. And this bothers a lot of people. Uh, not too long ago, I see Fizrev letters. Somebody has discovered, says, this, this uh, um, Lagrangian, or actually they were pointing at a Hamiltonian, is wrong. This was in Fizrev letters. It was completely garbage, but it got in the Fizrev letters. Okay? So it, even to this day, we're still uh, fussing about these, and, and we should. Uh, that's a, uh, you know, part of physics, is to try to understand things at a deeper level. But in any case, here's our Lagrangian, and we can calculate the canonic, uh, canonical momentum. Uh, this is supposed to indicate some sort of truthiness, uh, uh, that what we have uh, called it's the covariant momentum because of, of how it varies, and that's being more truthful, I think. But anyway, the canonical momentum is defined by a v-derivative. Okay, so I take a v-derivative of this thing. Okay, it's easy to take that one. That just gives me mv. I knew that all along. But when I take a, a v-derivative of this thing, I get the vector potential times the charge of the object. This one is uh, being uh, driven by velocity times the mass, this thing's being driven by another vector, the streaming potential times the charge. Okay, so it's kind of some symmetry there uh, to, to maybe look at later. But uh, what we're going to do is notice, first of all, that um, if the vector potential is zero, this does reduce to what we uh, know and love as momentum. But this is the new momentum. Not just mv, it's got this darn thing with charge times uh, a, a vector. Uh, that uh, is some kind of velocity. It's a streaming velocity. This is a, a velocity of just a particle, but th this has got a field attached to it. Okay. So, the usual Lagrangian, t minus v. Okay. Uh, electric scalar potential, and that's true, you get that, if the magnetic vector potential is zero everywhere. So keep your charges fixed and you'll be okay, but if you move them, you've got this new thing to worry about. So we, we say the canonical momentum is the usual form uh, for this thing at dA equals zero. Otherwise, the vector potential tax on this extraordinary uh, canonical momentum. This is kind of this. It's like the momentum that we're used to has been boosted by the A. Or another way to look at it is the particle momentum, okay, not canonical, not uh, covariant, uh, uh, but related to this thing as follows. That is, the particle momentum will be the momentum uh, that we now have crowned as canonical for uh, classical purposes minus the streaming stuff, whatever it is. Okay. All right. Now, Hamilton. What's he got to say about this? What's uh, his equation going to be like? Well, how do you get the Hamiltonian? You, in this class, you get it from Legendre or Poincaré. Okay, two French guys. All right? You don't believe, believe them? <laughs> well, you better. You better. They've done so much and so amazing. But in any case, velocity dot p minus the Lagrangian that we've just written. There it is. Uh, velocity dot our new p 
and then minus the Lagrangian limit, that funny uh, scalar plus vector, uh, I should say, scalar minus vector uh, A. Okay? Now, uh, when you uh, tack these things together, look what happens. This thing disappears. Okay? This is V dot A. This is V dot A. This one has a plus sign. This one has a minus. It's gone. What? Have we made a mistake here? Is this a typographical error like, uh, you know, having so many of these days? Um, no, it isn't. That's the original Hamiltonian ignoring magnetism. And it's numerically correct, but not formally, not, part, not with the expected derivatives. We've got to fix it. Okay, we've got to fix it. Because we've got to write this thing in terms of canonical momentum. That's the, the deal, right? And that, by the way, is a relativistic truth, but we, we won't get that until the very last day or so of this class. But uh, the vector potential seems to cancel out completely, leaving you with a T plus V and a scalar potential. Okay. Numerically correct, but not formally. You're not going to get anything out of this thing. You're not going to get any truths out of this as you take different derivatives to get Hamilton's equations. Okay. So the Hamiltonian must be an implicit function of P. It must replace the velocity V using Particle velocity is equal to the canonical minus the streaming times the charge. Okay, so we, we stick that in there. Now it's correct formally. So now it's up to us to check this thing and see if it gives us equations of motion that are, well, what we started with. That's the ideal here. Is run this thing through the truth machine, so to speak. Okay, so here's our kinetic part. Here's this weird thing. That's the coupling that you deal with if you're going to play with Hamiltonians. Actually, it's called the minimal coupling because most of the time we're going to um, uh, say the P, which is a, a partial derivative, a divergence of A is zero. So we often pick up, uh, uh, shall I say, a gauge. That's a weird kind of way of saying a quantum mechanical coordinate system uh, for describing this thing. Uh, we leave that one out and just have A dot P. But uh, it shouldn't make any difference in this classical because P and A can be on either side of this equation. So we really need to just cancel that two there and go, to, go about our, our classical business. But then we have this thing right here. This one is kind of saying that the electromagnetic field is an oscillator with an amplitude. And that's what really A stands for, is the amplitude of something that, do, that drives the magnetic, uh, electromagnetic field. And then we've got our old friend, uh, the scalar uh, potential there. Okay, so let's take these things and see if we went ahead and expanded the thing here in its correct uh, 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 use of variables. Let's look at Hamilton's velocity equation. What do we get if we just uh, ask for what's the partial derivative of this thing with respect to p? That that. Uh, is, is uh, uh, kind of neat to uh, see. And basically, you can look at this one right here, uh, since this thing isn't a, a function of p, uh, and just write it out, and there you go. That's the velocity. That's what we said our velocity was. It's, it's, uh, here's the particle velocity, and then divided by m, there's the canonical thing divided by m minus this. So there's some kind of shift going on here uh, in velocity, but that's what uh, the first Hamilton's equation uh, uh, says. Okay, that's just a, a, a copy of the particle velocity relation that we uh, uh, use to replace the velocity uh, with this uh, this canonical momentum. So now we're going to start writing all this stuff uh, in indices because we've got some curls and gradients, divergence, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the uh, p dot equation of uh, Hamilton is this one, p dot a equal minus the partial derivative of a of h, the Hamiltonian with respect to coordinates. So I've got to do a minus a partial of this thing and a minus a partial of the uh, phi uh, that uh, Hamiltonian has tailing along here. 
and uh, the result is uh, this, but that doesn't look like anything we've seen before. We do have to work on this thing a little bit. Well, we recognize this thing right here is what we call a velocity, okay? And then we uh, also have uh, here, this is uh, um, uh, a relation that follows more or less from what we have said the electric field uh, should be. This is Maxwell's equation coming to the rescue here. And uh, so we've got uh, these two uh, things. This one is a derivative with respect to the coordinate, this one with respect to time. The electric field is just sitting there, uh, for the moment anyway. And you can turn that thing, if, if you take the, the back to our definition of a partial derivative of A being a total derivative of A minus uh, uh, the, the chain rule uh, coordinate sum. Okay, which better to write this way uh, and just put a dot on the thing for this one. But there's the partial uh, that uh, we'd like to replace uh, there. And when you do that, uh, you get a lot of cancellation. You get the A dot here to cancel the A dot there. Things are beginning to look up. We get this V and this partial minus the V and this partial. Okay, is that anything we recognize? Yes, it is. It's V cross B, and there's E. We're back to the what they call the ponder motive, F equal M A equation that we started this whole thing with. Now this is the point where a Trumpian professor says, believe me. Okay. We got there's some things we uh, can do here uh, to maybe get a little bit of insight in this, but that will not be now. The, the, the relativity is what's needed to straighten this out. Okay? So, as I say, we've come back full circle. This is for particle mechanics. Okay? And we've used uh, that relation uh, for particle mechanics. All right. Well, let's see. Let's go back to sophomore physics and just work out how the uh, things move if you have uh, well, first an electric field, and in our mechanical analog, this will just be the ability to slope the table, okay? I can make an electric field in one, one direction uh, using that uh, funny device that we'll look at later. So that's the gradient part of all of this, uh, and a scalar uh, uh, potential is, is the thing we're taking the gradient of. E dot R gives me E, okay? good. Uh, but this device over here represents the streaming potential by the velocity of the table surface. Now you all learn in electromagnetism uh, that the B field has a vector uh, potential field that is a rigid rotor. Right? So this thing is duplicating that, at least as the geometry goes. Whether it gets the mechanics right, that remains to be seen. But that's what we've got. So in addition uh, to uh, this guy right here, we've got a vector potential here that is B cross R. This is B cross R over 2, 1 half B cross R. Okay? And it's the curl of that that's going to be constant. Okay, So this is the center of the whirlpool, right, where the uh, the uh, viscosity takes over and, like the uh, physics girl showed, has a region of constant motion. She didn't actually show this, but we know that, right, from that problem. Okay? So, uh, this is the center of the whirlpool. Outside that thing, it can have uh, zero curl, but inside it's got a constant curl. That's the uh, thing that we're talking about here. And the reason I gave you the problem on the non-analytic function that this describes is that it's full of curl. It's got constant curl everywhere. Okay, so that's what rigid rotation is, as far as the velocity field is concerned. Okay, so this is what we're we're going to claim. We'll, we'll prove this later, but I uh, just wanted to alert you that that's coming up. Let's do the ordinary calculus on differential equations of this equation of motion that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the ponder motive law added to 
uh, Newton's uh, equations gives us. Forget Lagrange's, forget Hamiltonian's, let's just go at this thing as simple as way possible. So I've got a V cross B here, which is, you know, kind of weird. We've got to figure out a way uh, to, to make use of that. And also simplify the notation somewhat. So I'm going to call uh, this E over M, very important ra ratio, the ratio of those two things that go, uh, you might say, the, the mass-related thing, the charge and the mass kind of are uh, uh, opposites, but uh, the, the similar is two. We're going to take the ratio, E over M ratio, uh, 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 and multiplying the electric field, we're just going to call that epsilon X and epsilon Y. And then we just have another E over M to make a, 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 just a plain old B. There's the letter B to represent the Z component uh, <clears throat> here of the B that's out of the right-hand rule, out of the uh, board uh, here in the Z directions. So we want to uh, write this equation here. But still, this, something that I'd like to do now is turn them into complex variables. Because then my cross product, remember that? That's the imaginary part of a complex product. So we'll have both of them real. We won't write anything. The cross will write an I in front of it. Uh, that, that's the trick here. Okay, so this is what it would look like if I use Gibbs notation with my epsilons. Okay, that's what it would look like. And of course, the cross products of the unit vectors that I'm using here are well known. Okay, X cross Y is Z and so forth. Uh, cyclically. Uh, that's the epsilon tensor working behind the scene on the cross product. But what I'd like to do is say, I'm going to write the velocity as Vx plus Ivy. Okay? The replacements here are the Ex will just be a 1 that's silent. And the Ey will be an I. Okay? That's the trick. Alright, make use of that stuff that we showed in... Uh, uh, Chapter 10 of the uh, review unit. So my um, my uh, electric field, my epsilon, is going to have an ex plus iey to replace uh, just the, the vector. So I won't be writing vector; I'll just be writing numbers and taking care of two dimensions all at once. So our new equation is v dot equal epsilon, a complex epsilon, minus a complex velocity, but just i times it. Okay, that's what uh, happened uh, right here when we uh, took that part of the uh, Gibbs notation equation and turned it into complex variable. So we've got this I V, and the I uh, rotates by 90 degrees, uh, basically. That's what is making uh, the coordinate Y out of the coordinate X. Okay? So those are replacement, and there's our equations. Velocity, and it's going to be, I'm going to do another thing here. I'm going to take away uh, this, this, this uh, beta, this extra dangling term here, this minus epsilon IB over IB. I'm going to take that away uh, from the velocity, from the velocity vector. Okay? That's what was originally uh, V. So this big V dot here is the little v plus beta dot, okay, the time derivative being understood here. And then this is just a little v, but that's big V minus beta. Okay. And let's see if there's anything uh, I D V T minus beta. Uh, <clears throat> and we've got the uh, that beta V that and this is going to be our V dot. So we, we get rid of the um, the, uh, let's see if that is, this is epsilon minus IB V. This is the beta dot. Um, to make sure I understand all of this. Um, dot, 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 dot. Um, I think that's, that should be uh, right. A um, little worried here. I've got a B beta that I'm uh, used to having, so I, suddenly I don't. See if that's right. Say again. There's somebody in the hall. No. Um, Sorry. I wish I had it right there, but let's see what's going on here. I want to make sure I've got this uh, right here. I've got this, that's for sure. 
be done. Okay, um, yeah, you implicitly differentiate the cap V term, and that gives you the B dot relationship below. Right, right, right. That, that, this is the uh, cap V, and I've added this extra velocity, basically, to it. And um, up, 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 uh, that gives me uh, V dot right here. And that's equal to, I have to figure out where that is. This is V minus beta. Big, big V minus beta is just uh, cap V. Cap V, yeah. Or, or, or little, this used to be little V, right? There's little V right there. So that's what that is. Oh, so that should be a little, little V at the end. I think that's right, yeah. Let just snap it. Let's look at the final form. Let's see if uh, I got How it this. sets. I'm, I'm going to move all of this stuff up on uh, one here. Let's see if that's beta, epsilon minus, minus epsilon. Because uh, right now what I'm going to be getting is this cap V times B. And I'm able to ignore this extra uh, I'm, I'm, I'm basically going to another reference frame here as far as velocity. So little v is this thing right here, and that's what we had before, but I'm just a little worried here. Well, we've, we've got the uh, plus v, so that's what it what was uh, canceled, I think. Um, and then v is equal to the electric field divided by the magnetic field. Um, with a, a Y component, basically. It's a Y component that we're worrying, worrying about here. Well, anyway, I think that, that works. Oh, the, the, it's uh, there. Pardon? It's there, it works. You take the final box and you move it in the two other terms down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this thing right here is just what we're working with, but it, we got it by getting rid of the uh, thing that was tacked on uh, to this. So, um, yeah, it, it's hard to give a lecture you, you see the, at the, the same time. The red beta gets yeah. this final box substituted in for it. Right. Yeah. And then the epsilon's cancel, yep. and you're left yes. with your final That's set. it. Right. It's, it's solid. Okay. Well, anyway, the idea was to get a simple exponential solution. So basically what this is doing is just saying you take your initial velocity and rotate it at a rate bt. So that's the cyclotron uh, motion uh, just exposed uh, in a very simple equation uh, there. So that's what big V does. And big V is little v plus this uh, beta. Okay, And um, what we're saying is uh, <coughs> that that a big V is going to be uh, being rotated, and it's this thing that's going to be rotating. So it's in a uh, reference frame that's moving at the speed, whatever beta is, and beta is the electric field divided by B, so beta is in the Y direction, that's the I direction. So that, that works out pretty well, I think. Okay, so there's the complex form of the uh, thing all written out using the little v and the original uh, expressions for an electric uh, field, this electric field, which is only in the x direction. And then the b guy uh, right here has an i in front of it. So basically, if you have an electric field in this direction, this is telling you you're going to be translating in the y direction, actually minus y direction. Turn it back into Gibbs notation, or better matrix notation, this is what it's, it's telling us. There's the rotation there. It's got a minus on it, so the minus doesn't go here, it goes there. This is a uh, rotation that's clockwise as opposed to positive counterclockwise. And then there's this guy, and these two components are, are showing up. Uh, the I goes on there, make it a Y, and then the imaginary part, that's this part right here, uh, is an x. So there's your uh, uh, velocity formula written in the 
vector form, matrix vector form. And we would like to also uh, get the coordinate uh, 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 for, form for that. We integrate this uh, complex expression one more time and get another minus IB coming down from taking the integral of that. And then uh, the integral of the rest of it uh, gives me uh, the, um, the next term here times time. Plus some constant, and the constant turns out to be that. I'm going to check that right now, but that is where you uh, would uh, start to think. So this is the final uh, solution here uh, written out in terms of actual coordinate x plus i or y, the, the q, okay, x plus i y. Okay, I think that things. Again, move the board up like they used to if there were many boards, right, all stacked on top of each other. Uh, this is what we're uh, looking at uh, for the actual position. Now, what does that mean? That, that here's the uh, matrix expression for it. We've got a rotation still with a minus sign on it. So this is got to have the minus on the lower uh, um, left-hand corner uh, to rotate all of this plus plus um, <coughs> the extra terms here involving the E over B, and then this stuff, the initial uh, position, initial velocity times time plus initial position. That's the vector form. Okay, So that, that's the best I can give you uh, in terms of convenience for figuring out you know, where this thing's going to go. And of course, the, the basic idea is the FBI rule will tell you, you know, the directions of all these things and we can check that. But um, here, here is what we're going to be doing. And that is we're going to be rotating something starting at some uh, position that isn't necessarily the origin and moving, translating uh, by that one. Okay, so the electric field is going to make us translate perpendicular uh, to uh, the um, electric field that we have applied. That's called the Hall effect uh, when it happens inside uh, uh, a metal or a semi. Conductor. So the way I like to look at this is uh, geometrically, of course, and what I do is, is there is uh, here a wheel of a certain size. The, 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 this, uh, this point, uh, this coordinate point, is on the rim of a wheel of radius E over B squared. That's basically what you're seeing uh, with this equation. And then you're adding a velocity here, and this is for the case that the electric field uh, is along the um, x direction, which I have pointing up here. The z direction is off to the side. That's going to be perpendicular to all the cyclone motion. And um, then there's a certain radius of a wheel, and if this uh, dot, this the actual coordinate, happens to be on the wheel, then you get an ordinary cycloid. But most of the time, you get either a correlate cycloid, or if it's inside the wheel, particularly if it's right at the center, uh, you get a prolate cycloid, uh, one that is uh, not curly, but more professional, I guess, is a way to say it. It's just kind of like a sine wave. Okay, so those are, those are the uh, motions that we're going to see uh, when we play with this, either on the computer. It's a lot easier to play with it on the computer than it is on that gadget over there. But uh, I want to take time in order to look at the gadget, too, assuming it's, it's going to work. So this is the, the stuff that um, is available uh, in the simulation. Okay, um, <clears throat> This is the simulation uh, uh, of synchrotron motion. That's really what it, what it is. I'd, I'd like to take a, look, a little bit of a look at that uh, before we go over to the uh, uh, mechanical guide. I'm much more sure that this is going to work. That guy right there has few screws loose, so uh, it may be uh, that it, it doesn't uh, uh, work uh, as well. But then we'll come back and look at the video of this uh, mechanical device uh, to uh, see that, in fact, it, it is possible to reproduce electromagnetism uh, uh, using just uh, plain mechanics. Uh, uh, at least in two dimensions. Okay, um, let me uh, 
go ahead here and um, what I'll do is I'll just uh, take this one right here, I think, and just show a typical uh, motion that you got. I drop a particle in a gravitational field, and pretend that's the electric field, this is just a mass that has uh, some charge on it, and it's cycloids. So that, that's what's going on here. Uh, depending on what uh, initial velocity I give it, if I give it uh, more velocity down than zero, I think that's what I've got. Well, there's a whole bunch of trajectories that come out of that one. It's, uh, it's really quite a beautiful thing. You, you see it's acting like an oscillator, a swarm of particles all, all following uh, the uh, um, cars. Now, I'm going to go back, I think it is, to this one and see if I can get that one to just do one particle. So I'm going to reset T equals it now. You no. scroll down and we'll change the beam to on top yeah, of it. Yeah. Right, I, it's do swarm. Uh, one more over. Now undo that and then... Do yes. this one right here. Okay. That way we'll get uh, something that uh, is a little simpler. So let me erase the paths there and uh, go ahead and reset this one. Okay, so this is, this is what you get with a this fairly strong magnetic field here, I think it might reduce the strength of the uh, what we call the Zeeman field here uh, just a little bit. Um, I'm going to bring it down to uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.3. Let's go very slowly. Uh, I'll race path here, and then I'll just uh, let it go. Time equals zero. So w wherever I put a particle and give it some velocity, I get a phaser. But the phaser always goes, and this is a, uh, a field uh, coming into the, um, let's see, is it, it's right, BZ is, is positive. Um, so, hmm. It, uh, you got the charge set to be in positive. If I throw it this way, I get a circle going around. If I throw it this way, would I get a circle going that way? No, it's always going clockwise. You see, that's, it's, no matter where you go with a magnetic field, you always get either clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, motion. Okay, so that's, that's the uh, plane field without the electric field. But then what's interesting is, uh, erase the paths here, turn on an electric field that's down, Stark field pointing down. And that's your horizontal component. Right there. And then uh, start up, uh, well, just drop it. And it, it, <laughs> it really takes off to the right. Uh, what I need is an electric field that's not so powerful. And that's the trouble is we're, we're working with numbers that are uh, outlandish here. Uh, let's bring it down to, try to bring it down to minus point 0.1 and maybe then uh, I'll get, now, uh, it's making a liar out of me. Something else going on here uh, that is uh, uh, screwing us uh, uh, badly with that. Uh, that is a, just decrease it somewhere. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the Zeeman field. I'm just going to set that to zero. And uh, just turn on the Y field. That's actually the one I wanted to do. And just make a very small negative value. See if we can... you uh, got two components now. The other one didn't zero for some reason. Oh. Okay, there we go. Let's try uh, again here and see what happens. Yeah, it, it falls to the right. So it, instead of going, instead of falling down as it would with a zero uh, field, and let's uh, let's see where we uh, sit here. The, let's see if I can get this thing uh, to work here. We, we definitely need uh, canned scenarios for this thing. Um, Zeeman field, uh, let's make a, a point 
zero point uh, oh five and see if that will be enough to uh, get this this going. Uh, Why don't you use the scenario we had and then just take the beam feature off and that'll be exactly okay, what you then. want. I'll go over to this one and see uh, what we've got. We've got the beam scenario. Uh, do swarm and beam. Just leave it the way it is, right? I think. Weak I'm field. assuming that's the one that came off the page, yeah. So there we go. With so it isn't. Because the other one had two, co had two fields. It had electric and magnetic. It's only magnetic. Um, yeah. But if I put a minus field on this one, let's uh, do a minus 0.05 and see if it will um, obey for us. There we go. Okay. So I should be able to uh, set, uh, for example, if I throw the thing uh, a little bit this way, get a prolate cycloid, throw it a little bit this way, I get a, I'm sorry, I got a curlite, the first one. If I throw this one just the right velocity this mm -hmm. way, and that's too fast, that's uh, too slow, a little more. If you got to read, look at your readout there and then yeah. just increase it. Anyway, it, it should be possible to throw the thing this way a certain amount and have it follow a straight line. But if you throw it more than uh, the right amount, which clearly that one will be, it takes off. We'll do it down here and show that. It takes off. Okay. As you throw more and more this way, it, it takes off the of curls, but with a, the curl light cycle being upside down. So that that's uh, interesting. And of course, you throw it up, you get the curlite that lines up. Um, so this is some, you know, if you want to get a feeling for what all these things do, it's this is a good playground. Um, after we get some scenarios put in that we can, um, you just can and do quickly. All right, let's um, let's take a look at the uh, mechanical animal. This is a mechanics course, not like a magnetic one. So uh, this guy right here uh, is uh, uh, pretty cool. Now, just just so that we um, don't run out of time here, we'll we'll stay after and, and play with the actual thing. But here is the uh, movie of the thing. I think. Let's see if it comes up here. It's on YouTube. And um, I'll go ahead and increase the uh, screen here, Let's pull a stop here and uh, take it out. Okay. Oh, and, and something else I ought to do, I ought to turn on the sound because then you can really see what, hear what, what, what we're doing here. Uh, where it's, let's see if I've got a sound control here. Um, I think I do here. I'm going to increase the sound uh, to uh, make it Thing, and I'll take the uh, thing to, to time equal zero here. Okay, here we go. So you see the thing does a cyclotron motion pretty much in this particular case making the same circle we're expecting the lab. But it is expanding because the thing slips a little bit. And there's an interesting ratio between what this thing does. If I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in that time it will make two rotations. And that will try to demonstrate uh, when we actually play with that uh, thing. So uh, let me show you where that uh, uh, occurs in this discussion of the mechanics of the thing. The mechanics of the thing is just an exercise in constraints. That's going to be our last lecture uh, next week um, in this uh, unit, two units.
Um, this was just going through the, the, the derivation of the equation of motion. Uh, here, V dot, that's a, a force, a, acceleration, is equal to the uh, omega of the uh, table cross V. Well, that results in a motion, V dot, that is the change in V, the force effect, is equal to the uh, uh, omega cross V. And um, here is uh, showing what happens uh, what this constant, the charge, what the charge is. The charge, uh, that's an E over M ratio actually, uh, is, is tied up in this. It's 1 plus MR squared divided by whatever inertia this ball has. If it's a solid ball, which is what we've got, that's 2 fifths. I over MR squared is 2 fifths. So this is 1 plus uh, uh, 5 halves. Okay, so it's 5 halves uh, plus 2 halves. Uh, 7 halves uh, is this uh, number right here. So that's 2 for 7. This omega is 2 revolutions of the orbit for 7 rotations of the table. Okay, that's kind of weird. But it's very precise, a uh, very precise thing. So, uh, let's go ahead and try to run the actual mechanical analog over here. You're welcome to stick around and try various things with it, but let's just see if it'll work uh, for the basic thing. And if everything is still the way it was when I started um, this afternoon, you, come, you can come on over and just uh, hang around this area here. And then if you want to take this, the driver's seat here, you can... Basically, I have the table set more or less so that there's very little slope. And it's hard to, you know, keep this in because it keeps sinking into the rug. But um, it's pretty level. Okay, I put a ball in the center and uh, it uh, will uh, not move uh, most of the place. And that's the other thing, it isn't perfectly a plane. But um, let's go ahead and start rotating the table. And I'll just sort of slow this thing down. There's the, uh, the uh, cyclotron motion, okay? So, if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it should have done two rotations. And I don't know if you were going. Let's try it again. You watch the ball and I'll count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I started with one. I should have started with zero, right? So let's do that again. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right there. So it's pretty close to two rotations uh, in, in, the, in that thing. Now the way you uh, control this thing, and that's what you can do when you're sitting over here in the driver's seat, is if you want the thing to move, turn up the electric field, okay? When you turn up the electric field, uh, for example, let me go ahead and try to really hard to. You sort of have to remember if you want this thing to go somewhere, you, you t tap it perpendicular to where you want it to go. <laughs> but uh, when I put an electric field toward me, it cycloids toward you. <laughs> okay. Turn the electric field the other way, I can make it come back. And then we're going to be setting oscillators in the next unit, unit four. If I, uh, let's see if I've got, uh, I'm going to try to get this guy to, whoo, there we go, good catch. Um, let's, let me see if I can set the field to zero again. And then I'm going to try to resonate it at, I'm trying to get pi over two ahead of this thing. Okay, so I see it doing a little circling. I follow it. Pi over two out. This is resonance. If I if I if I do follow it, I have to. 
it's really hard to do it kind of like rubbing your tummy and scratching your nose at the same time. But that's that's the cyclotron. That's the old-fashioned uh, device that starts with a charge in the center and then as the electric field uh, oscillates you out and make an accelerator. It's the first accelerators that were uh, ever built. So that's what that does. Now if I put it in the opposite side and follow it, let me uh, get it up. Uh, I'm going to make it get back in the center there. And then I'm going to give it a pretty good kick. Let's see if I can, if I can follow it and stop it. Anti-resonance, right? If you can resonate something, you can anti-resonate. And there it is with the electric field toward me so that it's uh, cyclotroning uh, or Hall affecting uh, towards you. Okay. And then anytime I want to do something to it, that, that, that pretty well killed it right there. So you're welcome to try driving it. And if you want to drive it faster, turn up the speed. <laughs> Convince yourself it's not a fence or And it shouldn't matter if it's a solid ball. I'll try to. I don't think I'm, I'm catching it. It's too fast for me. No, it's. We're it's leading it a little. It's, I hear it slipping too. No. <sighs> I haven't been able to do it yet. I don't have the motor skills yet. Yeah, it's. it's I sort of got to go with it. There, I, I've got it. I got it cut down. Anyway. Um, those two rotate the same frequency, even though one's very much smaller than the other, until finally Now you see the problem uh, with resonance is while I'm resonating or unresonating that guy, I can't be unresonating the other guy unless they're in sync. You see, so that's what makes a cyclotron pretty squirrely when you don't have the uh, right arrangement of charge. Okay, I'm going to slow it just a little bit down and go ahead and if you want to, uh, you know, uh, try it. It's also fun to put two balls the same size so they dance with each other, but. Um, let me get rid of the electric field. When you put the E parallel either that way, let's see what happened there. I think I uh, undid a wire or something. See if it's heating up. Yeah, I don't know what that was. Anyway, uh, you're welcome to try it out. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real exercise in. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it won't be so hard. Yeah.